Hello, I'm Timothy Hobbs, and today I'm going to be doing another live stream for Vegan Buddies. I'm going to be developing a matrix bot written in Rust that allows you to look up buddies, vegan buddies, uh, by their geographic location. And it'll also allow you to rate those buddies and report those buddies. Uh, if they're like evil, they harass you or give you nasty information or scam you. And also, the buddies will be able to report you, and that will help keep the community safe. So it has basically three functions. It allows you to look up people, it allows you to rate people, and allows you to report people. And so far, the first thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be um, building the lookup mechanism. And last week, I or not last week, previous the week before last since last week I I kind of missed the stream I was too busy working on the house I'm remodeling my house um, but the week with the week previously I uh, was working on the geographic lookup and I was v examining various mechanisms for storing locations semi-anonymously and I kind of uh, came to the conclusion that this one uh, hex pix uh, method of storing location was probably the best. Just a reminder, Vegan Buddies is an app, a uh, mobile app, or will be a mobile app that uh, allows new inexperienced vegans to connect with uh, experienced mentors and you can check us out at veganbuddies.org. So let's get to it. I'll launch up Emacs and <clears throat> see where we're at. I guess I should also launch Zurnal because I was creating some notes in Zurnal and not really quite sure what I'm going to do today. So. Last week I had worked on the design in Zornal and I had looked at a couple of mechanisms for uh, storing the user's location and looking up user's location. I don't want to store exact user locations because that's kind of creepy and perhaps a um, privacy problem, especially since I don't want to be like super perfect about ensuring that we don't get hacked. I want to make sure that if we do get hacked, I mean, nobody's perfect. Nobody is perfect in terms of preventing hacks. And so I want to make sure that if we do get hacked, um, the user locations are going to be revealed. And so I'm just not going to store them at all. And I had looked at the possibility of creating this kind of honeycomb uh, structure across the Earth. And trying to project a honeycomb structure over the Earth turns out to be kind of difficult since the Earth is a sphere. And so I looked at, like... The possibility of using a grid also was kind of difficult. And what I came up with is this heel picks nested numbering scheme that's used by astronomers to store images of outer space as if you were looking up at the sky. So it's used to store images of the sky, but it's a really good way of storing rough uh, locations. And the reason why it's really good is that it divides the earth up into equally sized chunks and so you just store in the database which chunk you're you're residing in and then you can um, look up mentors in the current chunk and neighboring chunks and that would allow you to look them up geographically without storing the precise locations I guess another way that you could do things would be to store like really rounded latitude and longitude numbers, which would work just fine, except near the North Pole where you would get really absurd results. Okay, so let's get to it. Mm. <coughs> Heel picks uh, coordinates are, I believe, one number, one integer, which is really uh, makes it really easy to store them. And um, so I need to create a schema for my database. And I've been using this 
library. I've been trying to learn to use this library for Rust called Diesel that allows you to interact with databases. And Diesel makes you create uh, migrations by hand. And then it also requires you to create this schema.rs file where you define uh, your table. And so my, I, I, was, I started out uh, just copying the, the, I started out just copying the oh, brain, brain freeze, uh, the diesel getting started tutorial. And so that's why there's posts here, but I'm going to change that to mentors or since this is a generic library, it's not going to be called mentors. It's going to be users. And each user is going to have an ID, uh, matrix, Nick. I already uh, started defining what I want to have in my table in the readme. So I'm going to go and use that as a reference. So the user table, I said that there was going to be latitude and longitude, but it's going to be heel picks, I think. And this is going to be uh, int eight. I presume that's eight bytes, four bytes and eight bytes. I'm not really sure though. Um, Okay, and body, no, I'm the, so heel picks, heel picks region that the user resides in, and And their lobsters address uh, because we store whether they're a mentor by looking up uh, whether they have a profile in lobsters on their on our on our lobsters instance, not on like lobsters dot r lobster dot r lobster dot r s. Okay, so I've created this table, and then I need to create migrations that will. Um, copy that or like kind of mirror that and first before I like change those migrations I actually need to undo the migrations uh, that I did when I followed the getting started tutorial because I want my database to be clean and so I need to go ahead and launch my development environment and uh, undo those migrations. So I think that's going to be dot slash de develop and and then it's going to be I don't remember what command I should use. I think I'm going to have to look that up in the tutorial. So getting started, so diesel migration undo maybe, uh, diesel command not found. What do I need to do in order to do get that into my path. Mm, I'm not really sure what I did previously. Maybe it's in the, no. 
It's not in the bash history. Now I'm kind of confused. I don't know what I did to install diesel. Or where the diesel binary is. I guess it's possible that when I restarted Docker, the wherever Cargo was storing the binaries got lost, that Docker is storing them somewhere. And I need to change the Docker Compose configuration so that the binaries are staying where they ought to be or that they're maintained across Docker restarts. I think I did that last stream, so I, hypothetically I could look that up and find out. So successfully. I need to pause this and so here obviously here I had diesel installed and it seems that it's just in the path in this in this video so where did it go I had just done like docker compose update and i so it's not like an impersistent like state in the image would it's not like it's, it's a problem with persistence because that was a new container right i'm so confused where did diesel go Okay, so now I'm really confused because it's clear that last uh, two weeks ago this worked and now it doesn't. Now it doesn't. Bash command not found. Okay, so I'm going to, of course, change develop so it launches bash rather than sh. Um, but that's not going to fix my problem. Uh, de develop.sh bash.
Okay, so we're in the container, but it's diesel D I E S E L D I E S E L. D I E S E L. Hmm. Cargo is here. Mm -hmm 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 -hmm. D S C L I. Okay, so now I'm installing it again, and then I will commit the container, and I look at the changes. I think the Docker has some kind of diff utility. I don't, I don't think I've ever used it, but I'm pretty sure it does. That you can diff layers. That should make it so that I would be able to see where it's storing those files, and then move all those files over to a volume so they get uh, persisted. Okay, so now we have diesel in the path, and so now I'm going to go ahead and exit out of this and do docker commit And now I need to docker diff image against parent layer. Really? Really? There's no, like, just a tool to do that? Really? Uh, 
Okay, so maybe I'll see what happens. Docker diff. User local cargo and uh-huh. How is it even that cargo, which is running, which isn't even running as root, is even able to write to user local? Huh? I didn't write sudo cargo install. I wrote cargo install and I was a normal user, wasn't I? Yeah, so here it's user test, right? I'm creating that test user. How is it that cargo is even able to write to user local cargo? Hmm? Is user local cargo like world writable for some reason? Or is cargo like sewage bit set so it can do that? That doesn't make any sense to me. Right, I just did cargo install, no sudo cargo install. As a normal user, you know, the files ended up here. That's terrible. Mm-hmm. Horrible. Awful. Okay, so what happens? Obviously, if I do develop.sh right now, it's going to delete that container. Uh, docker ps docker exec minus it dash echo. User local cargo, uh huh. And it's world writable, huh? RWX world writable right there. That's really, really weird. That's really, really weird. That's just wrong. Okay, so um, it's like it's like it's creating the ability to for any user on the system to store a binary somewhere that's not like in their control. That's just awful. Okay, so I guess I'm going to try to fix this by by going to the Docker file. matrix docker file and then I don't remember what the, the syntax for this is so I'm just gonna try something or maybe I should look it up so I don't waste time docker file e v syntax env equals okay so i'm using it correctly 
like that. And then if I do uh, make So once I get this little database thing going, I'm the next step for me is going to be creating, it, it, I can have either one of two steps. I can create, I can try to set up the matrix bot, or I can try to create all of the functions required by the bot um, and have them in units and test, the, have them tested. And then I can set up the bot as like the last step. In order to test the bot, I'm probably going to have to set up a local matrix server, probably within the same Docker Compose environment, and then have that linked to the matrix bot. Mm -hmm. And then I guess I'm going to have to write a different script that'll communicate with that test server and try to like chat between them, chat between the bot, like the two bots will chat together in order to like do the automated testing. Okay. So, uh, need to drink water. So now I can do develop again and do cargo install again, or I'll look at cargo home first and see if that environment variable actually got passed through. And then I can do cargo install again and hopefully things will be persisting properly this time. So, echo cargo home. And now cargo install diesel CLI. Has to re download everything. Wait, is that like even more of a security issue than I thought? If cargo bin is world writable, could then binaries be overwritten? Like if user test installs diesel CLI and then user bar uh, rewrites that binary to being something malicious, then user bar could get access to user test. Isn't that like a root? Um, like what if user root then calls diesel? That seems like a horrible security problem. Does cargo really do that? Uh, like by default? Okay, so I'm gonna have to check this out because that's just weird. Um, so, I was doing that on Alpine. Um, maybe Alpine is just broken, you know, because Alpine is a weird in distribution done by weird people. At least I, th or is it? Wait, what is the Docker file? I don't want to. Cast shade on Alpine unnecessarily. So cat matrix uh, docker file buster debian what and where's cargo being installed where's cargo or, or where is rust being installed okay okay so this is a rust image already uh-huh and is this a is this a 
aspect of the way the Docker image is configured, or is this an aspect of the way um, Rust is configured? Like, if the Docker image is just configured like that, it's probably not a security issue because you don't expect to like have real boundaries between users inside a container. Um, do I have cargo here? I don't even have a user local. Cargo install DSL CLI. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. It's just that it's really fascinating to me if there would be like such a severe security issue in cargo. I'm I'm hoping that that problem is is just a, a weirdness of the way Docker the Docker image is configured, and it's not actually a a serious security flaw. Okay, so while I'm waiting for that, I'm probably going to have to reconfigure the path as well. Yeah, diesel command not found, and I need to change the path. Like that. Okay, so I need to actually um, put this in the somewhere. Perhaps, I don't know if you can do if environment variables are are accessible like this i'll try it and in the meantime okay this is taking a long time and in the meantime i will um i guess i'm just going to rebuild the image make this is quite slow and tedious but what can you do I never did figure out like how to get it so that that build context wouldn't be sending over a bunch of useless garbage to the Docker daemon, which is running locally anyways. Docker works in such a way that it takes the current working directory and it compresses it as a tarball and sends it over the Docker socket to the Docker daemon. And so you can build images on an external server, which you basically would never do. Um, basically, Docker can work with the daemon running on a completely different machine, and the Docker client would, like, work normally. Uh, but for local development, this is incredibly inefficient, sending two gigabytes of data over a local socket, data that will never be used in the Docker build process. Um, and... Yeah, and the Docker ignore file apparently does not prevent that data from being sent. Uh, somebody should create a pull request. So now, yeah, so now my path is set up correctly. Excellent. Um, so where was I? I was trying to get it so that I had unmigrated um, all of the uh huh. Okay, so the now I've reverted all the migrations, and I can write new migrations. And at the same time, I'm finding out what happens with cargo on NixOS. If cargo on NixOS also has the security flaw that it's in storing. Uh, 
binaries globally in a globally writable folder that it somehow magically creates. Okay, so I have this migrations folder. And when I was following the tutorial, they had basically two um, migrations. One, which I guess is created automatically somehow. And the other one, which we wrote is by hand. Yeah, so this migration was automatically created by Diesel to set up helper functions and other internal bookkeeping. This file is safe to edit. Any further changes will be added to existing projects as new migrations. Uh-huh, that's interesting. Okay, so, and then there's this one that sets up the table. And so what happened to schema.rs? So we have, we don't have this, we want to change it so that it's actually like the table that we wanted. So the table that we wanted is users. And so each user has an ID, a matrix, Nick, uh, a non-null, a 64-bit non-null integer, and now I need to look up SQL data types because I really don't know. What are the number data types in SQL? What the heck, I can't spell. Char, var, char, binary, blob, tiny blob, long text, long blob. Okay, so here we are, int. Big int. Wait. They say the maximum size, but they don't say the number of bits. Is this, I don't remember exactly how large a 64 bit number is, but I need a 64 bit integer. I don't need some, something that's not quite a 64 bit integer that could lead to weird situations. 63 bits. Okay. So I guess it's going to be big int. It doesn't recognize that as being a um, data type. And then lobster's address. Uh-huh, it doesn't know how to install diesel, but we can look. Yeah, so it's it, normally it's installing the cargo stuff to home where I thought it would install it in that Docker image is just weird. Okay, so there is no uh, serious security flaw. It's just a weirdly set up Docker image. Anywho. So I have 40 minutes in, so I have 20 more minutes to go. And I guess uh, why you should, um, so I need to, to do the down migration as well, the drop table users, and then I can do diesel migration redo, run, Syntax error. What's the syntax error?
near parentheses. I really don't know SQL, so I don't I don't see the the syntax error. I I'm really not sure what's wrong with this syntax. Um, so I'm going to go and look at the tutorial really quick to see what the correct syntax is. And it really looks very, very similar. Wait, that's the RS. Where is the migration? The SQL. Create posts. Uh huh. Wait, I'm really confused. Did I somehow mix up the schema.rs file and. No, I just have the wrong file open. So, create table users. Create table posts. ID serial primary key, ID serial primary key, comma, title, blah, blah, blah. I really don't see where there could be some kind of syntax error. At or near close parentheses. Okay, so if I just delete all of these, it still doesn't, it's still not happy. Okay, ID serial, primary key. No trailing comma. Okay. Super. So now I've uh, set up that migration. I've created the table. And I can go ahead and start um, thinking of what the various methods are going to be. So there's going to be a method for storing a new user. There's going to be a method for looking up users and there's going to be a method and and there's going to be a method for showing everything about a user. And I guess the store is going to be both update and create. And it's going to be, of course, accessible only to that particular user. So um, the matrix Nick is actually going to be like the primary key. Um, okay, so one thing that I just remembered is that it's not possible to merge exports from databases that use serial incrementing primary keys. And it is possible to merge exports from databases using UUIDs. And I think that's like quite impractical not to be able to merge database tables. Um, so I'm probably going to switch over to using UUIDs. So I'm going to look up how to do that. SQL use UUIDs.
But if I do that, then I have to like make it so that every bit of code that creates new things is gonna, it's not like val, it doesn't seem to be native to um, SQL. It doesn't seem to be like that there would be an auto increment PSQL PSQUID Okay, so I think I can do this. Well, first I should do undo. Or what was the revert? And then I can do, I can put this here. And I'm gonna have to ch update the schema file as well. UI degenerate version four does not exist. Gen random UIUID. Okay, so now I have the primary key being a random UUID. And what, what now? Um, I needed to, or I wanted to update the schema so that it reflected the fact that, uh-huh, wait, I'm really confused. It's already a UUID? How is that possible? Was Diesel Tutorial already setting it as a UUID? I thought it said that it was serial. It's an auto increment. Okay. So that's, that's kind of confusing, but in any case, it's being stored as or aha uh -huh, the schema.rs file is automatically updated i'm a silly 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 person it's like in it's in it's, it's like in ruby on rails or active record okay so now <sighs> Getting ten, kind of tired? Okay, so 10 more minutes. Now I'd like to get it so that I can write some kind of function that does something with the database and tests that it does that with the database. I think that's a good thing to, good little tiny task to do. src lib.rs schema models I'm not really sure what the difference between schema is and models.rs is and why you have to create models.rs manually when schema.rs is created automatically. That's really, really not clear to me. But I think that I need to update this file uh, so that it reflects 
uh, schema.rs. And now I need to be able to post, uh, this isn't a post, this is a user and this is the table users and new user. I'm not sure why there's this like form struct, but And this is a U64. And I don't need this to be probably an address to a U64. It can be a U64 directly, unlike a string, which is variable with length. Okay, so I've set up this models.rs file and the last thing that so so we previously had created this um this file that was like just inserting new posts and displaying them to show that the database works. And instead of that, we need to set up some kind of file that I guess I need to think about how like the objects are going to be passed around, what kind of state the spot is going to have. Uh, before I can write the units. That's, I guess, one of the, the disadvantages of writing in Rust is you really have to understand how your state is being persisted, who's going to own that state, before you can write unit tests. Um, because if you start out and you write a bunch of things that are like owned, and then you realize that you need to have an unowned reference or something like that, then you just have to rewrite a bunch of stuff. I'm not really that experienced with Rust, so I, I'm still getting a hang of it. But that's kind of my understanding. And we're going to have, uh, let me look back at which library I, I've chosen for cargo.toml matrix bot API. Seem to recall that there was some like nice example somewhere. I see examples. S A with state. So here we have a state that could contain our connection to the database, I guess. And then there's this handle message uh, method that gets called every time there's a new message. 
So the, we create a new thing when we do that. I think that we would have it start out that the, the connection to the database was somehow null or unset or we would we would perhaps create first the connection to the database and then pass to the new method um, and then a connection so that it was set from the start and there would just be the connection to the database in the um, state and then each command would just interact with the database and respond and it would generate a string I guess to respond so so basically there would be different um, bot commands and then there would be this uh, e each of our functions would perhaps take the nick of the person that was sending the, 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 the command and the command text and then it would do something with the database and then it would return a string that was sent back to the user that had sent who had interacted with the bot initially okay so it's an hour into the stream and i'm getting pretty tired i haven't really finished anything today uh, but i did get a good start on things i think i have a good idea about how I should continue with uh, writing this uh, bot. I'll continue by um, implementing the individual commands. Um, there's going to be a guess. Um, there's going to be command for uh, looking up the user and adding a review for the user and reporting the user. So three commands, four commands, and setting. So you're going to look up users, um, maybe four. I'll go ahead and create a new uh, SRC black hole feature roadmap. And I'll create a new roadmap item for each command. So one command is going to be So anyone can look up a user by sending list of heel picks regions and they will get a paginated list of users back uh-huh what i need to do is i need to also have the bot be able to look up uh, which users were online most recently and um store that information in the table, don't I? Because then we not want to sort the users by who is online most recently. That's going to be a little bit of a challenge. When users Okay. So one command would be So one matrix bot command is look up and another one is um, uh, 
So the next command would register a user's location and Okay, so that would just comma separated list of ints. So we would just look up the users by um, their heel picks regions. Uh huh, I need to. Uh, type. So users can be either mentees or mentors, and that's determined whether they ha by whether they have a lobster's address or not. And this would um, is, uh, return So it's a YAML list and it would be like matrix Nick and lobsters lobsters address And then um, something like that. And it would just be a list of the users like that. And then you could find out more of them by opening up the lobster's address, I guess. I'm not really sure, but this is close enough for now. Um, if I look at the wireframe on veganbuddies.org, then I should see what kind of stuff we're showing about the users. So we're showing their rating and their name and where they are. And there, there's also like the name of the city they're in. I'm not sure how important that is, but we can always save that um, if we want. So. So the rating as well. And yeah, that would be look up, look up users, register, and then I'm not sure if it's really a good idea to have it so that um, uh, to have it like command line style because then it's like really difficult to add more data that you're you're like using or if you should be like sending the commands already in perhaps ESON or or YAML. Maybe it's better to to like send the commands as as YAML, since Matrix allows for multi-line messages. So why not? Um, 
So maybe... Commands are sent in YAML format. Register. Yeah. And then the same thing would be here. Menti or And how would pagination work in a matrix bot? I guess, um, you would send the page number like that. And so that it's like really stateless. You don't want it to be like you have to remember which lookups are currently active on the server side. That could lead to some really bad DDoS situations. Okay, so so this would actually be like page. And then this would actually be in a list like that. Yep, so I think that's a pretty good design. And now I just need to create the implementation. And what were the other commands that I wanted? So we can register users, we can look up users. Um, rate user.md. to be a clone there and I'm not really sure I don't remember YAML very well and rate would be um, matrix Nick so you're going to tell it which the user you're rating um, Finally, you're going to, wait, it needs to be zero to 10 so that there's not, 
It doesn't matter. Or maybe it would be zero to one best. And hmm, that's difficult because in the user interface, I think five stars works best. Okay, so rating zero to five and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, and the last thing that I wanted to, so I can register users, which So we can set our update ratings. Um, we can look up users. We get their rating and we need to be able to um, report. And this would be also another just YAML. So I guess it's really, I guess it would be impossible to list all of the possible reasons to report somebody, but there's like harassment or like, it's really important to distinguish between spam and harassment because the responses are so different. Harassment could be like a real dangerous situation. Spam is some kind of deluge of stuff that you just need to block. So spam is something you're just going to reflexively block and ban. Harassment is something that you might have to even like contact the police about. Um, spam harassment and what's the other problems that could happen? So I'm going to make those categories. It's just a kind of off the top of my head type of thing. Um, and I guess when I, I guess that there would be like, um, people that would be assigned to be moderators, um, in the database. So there's actually going to be another table for moderators and moderators are going to be, um, perhaps divided by region. I don't know. Or you could just have it globally. Um, and how moderators are going to be listed is, is to be determined. Okay. And I guess the last command that really occurs to me, I guess lookup user, um,
No, I'm not going to have a describe user come in. Then I am going to have a paginated user ratings. or reviews. So reviews is a matrix command. So we're going to send the matrix nick of the person we want to find the reviews for. And page number. And then we get something back. A YAML list of and rating. And reviewer. Okay, so I think that's all the commands. Obviously, I'm not going to list every possible command that could ever possibly ever be in the far distant future, but for now, that's enough commands to implement for a basic uh, minimum viable product. And I guess that's all I'm going to do today, is having specified those commands. And I'll go ahead and commit all of this. Maybe I'll break it up into multiple commits. Yeah, I should do that. So, Um, Super, so I've 
done quite a bit today, I think. It's been an hour and 20 minutes long stream, so that's quite a bit of focus time for me. And I will see you next week, and hopefully I will um, next week get to the point where I have written and tested um, the business logic for the register user command. I think that's a, a like bite-sized piece of work. So I'll see you next week, and goodbye.